Hi, for this video, I want to talk to you about methods of collecting data. So the first method that I want to talk to you about is known as an observational study. An observational study is when a researcher observes and measures characteristics of interest of part of a population. Uh, with observational studies, they can be very short. It could be just a few minutes of observing, or it could be something that takes place over a long period of time. There are observational studies that can go on for longer than 50 years, and it's really important in those types of observational studies that whoever is doing the, the study leaves the information for the next person that has to take over. So observational studies can be both retrospective and prospective. A retrospective observational study observes data that happened in the past. This would be a historian that was trying to make sense of something that happened in the past. An archaeologist could be trying to make conclusions about a past civilization based on the data and information that they find. A prospective observational study is something that starts right now, and then it st studies a group for a set period of time. Like I said, it could be something that's very short, or it's something that could go on for many numbers of years. So an example of this is a group of researchers give a sample of fourth graders a puzzle, and they simply observe how the students approach solving it. I know that I have a lot of students that sometimes get confused with observational studies versus experiments because experiments also involve observing. All of the other methods of collecting data will have some type of observation, but they have manipulation or something else going on with it. In observational study, you don't manipulate it at all. It is simply just going and observing things in their natural habitat. Okay, the next method that I wanna to talk to you about is known as an experiment. In an experiment, you do apply a treatment to part of the participants that are um, participating in the study. They will be known as the treatment group, and then you will record the responses. So the responses will be observed. Um, another part of the participants are going to be used as a control group, and this one, there is no treatment applied. And experiments can be done on humans. They could be done in a... Um, field study. It could be something that you're trying to figure out if a fertilizer works. And so depending upon what you are studying or experimenting with, uh, the control group could look very different. If you are dealing with humans, it's really important that you use what is known as a placebo. A placebo is just a harmless or fake treatment that is made to look like the real treatment. Um, if you are working with humans, humans a lot of times will report just feeling better by taking something. So it's really important to have a placebo in place if you are dealing with humans. So an example of an experiment when a pain medicine study was designed where half of the participants received five milligrams of the active ingredient and the other half was given a placebo that looked identical. Our next method of collecting data is a simulation. This will use a mathematical or a physical model to reproduce the conditions of a situation or process. Most of the time we do this using computers, and this allows you to study situations that are impractical or could be dangerous to create in real life. Simulations can save time and money. An example of this would be a car manufacturer using crash test dummies to simulate the impact on the driver if there were a car accident, and they can use various types of impacts. It could be a side um, impact, it could be head-on collision, but it's unethical to take a human and throw them into a car and slam them into a wall and see if they survive. So we would use crash test dummies to simulate the impacts that would be done on the human body. There's a lot of receptors that go into place with this. Uh, Tesla and other autonomous vehicles would have to use something like this to get their cars to be able to uh, drive safely without a human controlling the vehicle. Other examples of simulations would be if you are a hurricane glass manufacturer, you have to make sure that the glass can withstand the high winds and debris being flung at it. So you would have to use simulations to make sure that the glass does stay as one piece if it were involved in a hurricane. You don't want to just put it in there. Another example might be for air traffic control. You would want to use a simulation to try new air traffic control patterns because this is something that you don't want to be at a busy airport and decide, okay, what happens if I change the simulation or change the um, flight path because it 
could cause crashes and it could be catastrophic. So a simulation, like I said, usually will use computers and it is important way of gathering data for things that are unsafe to do in a real world situation. Okay, and then the last one that I want to talk about is a survey. A survey most of us are familiar with because all the time we are inundated with surveys. The example that I have down here is every time you go to the grocery store almost, they give you a receipt and they say, hey, there's a code at the bottom if you'd like to go fill out the survey. You have the chance to win something or they may give you a free um, product the next time you come back if you participate in the study. Um, with surveys, there are a lot of potential for bias. One of the potentials of bias is the wording of your questions. You do not want to do it in a way that could make it either negative or positive, depending upon your spin. So it's really careful to make sure that you do not use biased questions when you are asking questions. Um, these can be done live when, over an interview. It could be something that comes to you over the internet. You can have people call you or sometimes you'll receive them in the mail. The problem with surveys is a lot of times there's a large part of the population that will not fill them out. And so this leads to a non-response bias because there's people that just refuse to respond to them. Um, like I said, there is a questioning bias that could happen that you want to look for and um, that could lead people to go a certain way. Um, sometimes with surveys too, especially if it is done in an interview situation, people may not be honest about how they respond to the questions. Um, if their family thinks that they learn lean a certain way politically and they're being asked a question on live TV, they may lie about their response because they don't want people to know how they truly feel. So sometimes you can also have a bias based on people not feeling like it's anonymous. So if you do surveys, it's best to make sure that they are anonymous and that you do not have questions that would lead to some sense of bias. So hopefully this video helped to inform you on different methods of collecting data. If you have any questions, please let me know. If there's additional topics that you would like me to cover, please let me know that as well.